Hi friends, before we get started, um, if you take any pictures of you and your family and friends tuning into Snowdesk, go ahead and post them with the hashtag Snowdesk2021. And if you guys think of questions throughout the program, you can go ahead and put them under our Facebook in the comments. And maybe we will get to answer your question at the end of the program. Awesome. So we want to welcome everyone to this edition of Snow Desk, the show from the snow in Grand Teton National Park. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Ranger Luciana. And I'm Ranger Olivia. And we're coming to you live from the town of Moose in Grand Teton National Park, which is located in the northwest corner of Wyoming. Um, you can see on that map there that we are at the Little Star in Wyoming. Hmm, I wonder where some of our visitors or our participants are tuning in from. Yeah. It's pretty wintry out here today, as you can see. You've actually connected with us as we sit outside at a desk made out of four feet of snow. And this year we actually had to build Snow Desk a little differently to be able to practice social distancing. It was also different because we actually had quite a bit less snow compared to this time last year. So winters have varied quite a bit for us re recently. For example, so far this entire winter, about 135 inches of snow has fallen in the valley and about 300 inches up high in the mountains. Last January, in one month alone, we had 169 inches of snowfall which is the snowiest January we have ever had on record. I wonder if this weather is a little different than some of our viewers are experiencing hmm, today. I wonder. Well, Grand Teton National Park is one of the many special places that have been set aside to be protected forever. These special places like the Statue of Liberty, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and Yosemite National Park uh, to tell the story of all Americans and are very important to people around the world as well. There are lots of amazing things to learn, explore, and discover in these beautiful places, and they will always be here for you to visit. Until then, we're really happy that you came to join us in Grand Teton National Park virtually today. Grand Teton National Park was created to protect these beautiful mountains. I promise they're behind us. They're just very, very gray right now. <laughs> pristine waterways, and variety of wildlife. This place is incredibly wild, in part because of our extreme seasons. For example, we are coming to you in the middle of a very long winter. Our winter lasts anywhere from six to eight months, so at least half the year. And that is a whole lot of winter. And during these winters, we get a lot of snow. The average annual snowfall up in the mountains is 30 feet or 400 inches throughout the whole winter, which is about the height of a three-story building. So if you are in your house or your school and it's one story tall, think about three of those buildings stacked on top of each other. And that is a lot of snow. But it's not snowy all the time. Snow melts and turns into water and ends up in our lakes and rivers. And in today's broadcast of Snow Desk, we'd like to explore the role of water in Grand Teton National Park and your hometown. Water can exist in three different ways or states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. To help us remember, we have some hand signs that we will be showing you a little later. And we're lucky because we have all three states of matter or states of water in Grand Teton National Park. All right, and the first form of water that we are going to talk about is solid or frozen water, which is all around us here at Snow Desk in oh, the yes. form of snow. So our hand sign for solid or frozen water is going to be like this. So go ahead and cross your arms and give yourself a big hug. And solid water can actually come in a lot of other forms rather than snow like ice, glaciers, ice caps, and even permafrost. And we have a field correspondent standing by who'd like to tell you about a pretty unique form of frozen water that we have here in Grand Teton National Park. Ranger Anne, can you hear us? Hi there, my name is Anne and I'm a park ranger here at Grand Teton National Park. 
favorite form of frozen water, a glacier. This is one of 11 glaciers we find in the park today. A glacier is a large moving body of ice and snow that takes years and years to form. The weight of the snow and ice creates a lot of pressure and squeezes that ice and snow and makes it move downhill. That's different from regular snow and ice that you might encounter. Glaciers actually flow like a large river of ice. Imagine Silly Putty. Silly Putty is solid, but if you put it on top of a desk, you might see it ooze over the side because gravity is going to pull it down, just like a glacier. Glaciers are really big. They can be at least as big as your school, if not huge. Glaciers are a really important form of solid water because they can shape mountains, melt into cold, clean water, and serve as habitat for animals. One creature that needs glaciers to survive is the western glacier stonefly. Stoneflies are small insects that live in clear, cold water and lay their eggs in mountain streams. So imagine like water that has recently melted from a glacier. In fact, Grand Teton National Park just discovered a new species of stonefly in a stream formed by the melting water from the Middle Teton Glacier. And that stream is icy all year long. We know that stoneflies are very sensitive to water pollution, so having them here is special. Stoneflies tell us that we live in a healthy ecosystem. Furthermore, stoneflies are an important part of the food chain, and they provide sustenance for animals such as our beautiful rosy finch, and they eat the insects that we find in these cold, snowy habitats. So imagine if we didn't have glaciers, we wouldn't have these cold mountain streams, and we wouldn't have stoneflies, and they wouldn't serve as food for our beautiful rosy finches. So glaciers are a really important part of frozen water that we find here in Grand Teton National Park. They are my favorite form of wa frozen water, and I hope they're becoming your favorite too. So please think about, you know, a form of frozen water that you might find in where you live. And think about it for a minute and then turn to your neighbor and share what you thought of. So welcome from Grand Teton National Park. I will see you guys later. Goodbye. Thanks, Ranger Ann. Let's take a second to think about the question that Ranger Ann asked. Hmm, what's one form of solid water where you live? Hmm, let's just think about that. Well, Ranger Olivia, what's one solid form of water where we live besides, you know, all of this s oh, wonderful snow? That was going to be my answer, <laughs> all the snow. But I actually drove by Jackson Lake the other day and noticed that it was all frozen over with ice. Wow, so we have a bunch of ice here as well. Next, we have liquid water, which is the most prominent form of water on Earth. And the hand sign that we will use for that is our flowy arms, liquid water. And this is what we use to drink. Uh, we also cook with it and wash with it. Liquid water can be in the form of dew, rain, or rivers. And we have another field correspondent standing by who's broadcasting from the Snake River. Ranger Clay, Ranger Clay, do you hear us? Hi there, my name is Clay Hanna and I'm one of the rangers here in Grand Teton National Park. And I'm really excited to share with you one of my favorite forms of liquid water here in Grand Teton, and that's the rivers. Now I'm coming to you live from the Snake River, one of the largest rivers in the Western United States. Now we're fortunate here in Grand Teton that the headwaters or the start of the Snake River is just to our north. And that river flows through Grand Teton, through Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, and eventually all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Now that's pretty amazing to think about, that this water here eventually makes its way all the way to the Pacific Ocean. You know, I've always thought how long that might take. I wonder who I should ask. Maybe I'll just ask the river. River, how long does it take you to get to the Pacific Ocean? Wow, well said, well said. Now surprisingly, the river does not always look like this. When do you think the river flows the fastest? What time of year? Now if you said the spring or the summer, you're absolutely correct. 
Because during that period, all of this frozen water, this snow that we see, is going to start to melt. And as that turns from frozen water to liquid water, it's going to have to flow somewhere. And eventually it makes its way down to the Snake River. But in the winter, this time of the year, the, it can actually get cold enough at night that the river can completely freeze over, which is pretty amazing. Now, no matter what the river looks like, what the water looks like, whether it's frozen or liquid, creatures here in Grand Teton National Park, they depend on the Snake River in order to survive. Creatures like bald eagles, cutthroat trout, moose, beaver, and one of my favorite animals found here in the park, the river otters. Now, river otters are a member of the weasel family, and they've often been described as adorable, playful, and just all around fun. Now, river otters are carnivores, and they'll spend most of their time in and around the water, but they can also be found on the banks of the Snake River. They usually travel in family groups, and they can be seen wrestling on the banks or in the water, and even this time of the year, When there's snow on the banks, they'll make slides that go down into the Snake River, which is really fun. Now, river otters are very sensitive to pollution, which is important for us here in Grand Teton because that allows us to measure the health of the river and the ecosystem. Now, I want you to imagine this pristine river behind me. Imagine if the Snake River were polluted and how that would change the game. Well, it might mean that we don't have river otters, which could change the food web and completely change the ecosystem. So that's just one example of how rivers are an important source of liquid water. Now I want you to take a moment and I want you to think about where you live and all the different sources of liquid water that can be found there. And in just a moment, I'm gonna have you turn to a neighbor and just describe to that neighbor what your favorite form of liquid water is. But before we do that, I'm gonna send it back to the snow desk. Thanks, Ranger Clark. Can you believe you tried to interview the river? That's so silly. I know. So let's take a second to think about Ranger Clay's question. What is one form of liquid water where we live? Hmm. What do you think, Lushana? Well, well, he already said the river, but I also have liquid water in my water bottle. Oh, yeah. And it probably came from the tap or the sink. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So next, we are going to talk about water vapor, which is water in the form of gas, which is all around us. And sometimes we can't even see it. But I'm curious if any of our viewers have ever seen their breath on a cold day. Can you see your breath today, Lushana? Not today. It's a little warm. Yeah. And that is a great example of water vapor. And the hand sign that we are going to use for water vapor is gonna go like this. So wave your fingers around and slowly raise your arms up. And we find water vapor when water heats up. And here in Grand Teton National Park, we have a really special example of naturally warm water where Field Ranger Megan is standing by. Are you there, Ranger Megan? Hi, I'm Ranger Megan. I'm coming to you from Kelly Warm Spring here in Grand Teton National Park. And my favorite form of water is steam, or water in the form of gas, because it's sneaky and you never know where you're going to find it. In fact, sometimes it's invisible. You can see it a little bit here today. If it looks a little foggy behind me, that's because I'm standing next to a warm spring. It's about 80 degrees year-round, so a little, little cooler than your average hot tub. And there's a pocket of magma underneath us that's keeping that steam, that water warm and pushing it out into the warm spring for us. Now there are other animals in the ecosystem that'll take advantage of the steam here. Bison need to bulldoze through that snow with their big head, like a snow plow, to get down to the grasses, the sedges, the forbs. They're herbivores, so they need that stuff. Now if they were over at snow desk, they'd be digging through snow chest high on me. But I just measured the snow over there, and here at Kelly Warm Springs, it's only about six inches of snow. So a lot less work for them to get to that lunch. And they're 2,000 pound animals. They need a lot of lunch. 
So when you come out here, you might find bison wandering around and taking advantage of the warm steam in this area. They're an important part of our ecosystem. Without them, our food chain wouldn't be complete here. So we're really happy about that. They're also really important because this is one of the only places in the world that you can find free roaming bison. Now, that's just one reason why I like steam and water vapor. I want you to think about your home for a second and think about all the places that you might find steam and water vapor. You might have to imagine for a second because it's probably invisible. Once you've thought of it, I want you to turn to your neighbor and share your favorite form of water vapor back home. Snow Desk, back to you. Oh, thanks Ranger Megan. Hmm, what are some forms of water vapor where we are? Olivia, hmm. do you know this one's kind of hard? Yeah, this, this one is a little bit harder, but um, I'm thinking of when I made tea this morning and I watched water vapor come out of my tea kettle when it was boiling. Oh yeah, that's a perfect example of water vapor. And water vapor, or water travels in these three states of matter. So we'll review them. So we have the solid, and we have liquid, and we have gaseous. Excellent. So water travels in these th three states. And while many people come to travel to Grand Teton for a wonderful vacation, the water here gets to go on a trip way more spectacular. They get to go through the water cycle. Would you like to come along? Or the straps of your guitar Water moves about the Tetons you eat It's simple, can't you see? The water cycle, one, two, three Follow along to the tune of this song One, evaporation when the sun comes out Two, water condenses in the clouds Precipitation when the clouds get mighty heavy and the rain it all falls down. Then down our cascade to nearly hit up waterways brings the rain to our rivers and our streams. Glacial lakes are filled in the way that water will make us jump with joy. An excellent song. That is probably like one of my favorite songs. It's so catchy. <laughs> so you might be wondering if water travels by way of evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, where in the world, not just Grand Teton, can we find all the water at any given moment? Hmm. Especially like right now with all this talk about water, I'm getting pretty thirsty. Okay, Lushana, let's think about all the different places that you can find natural fresh water on earth. Oh, like Jackson Lake. Yeah, yeah, Jackson Lake has natural fresh water, but let's stick to general categories like lake rather than name a specific lake. Mm. So let's think about where else we can find naturally occurring fresh water. Hmm. Well, back in my hometown, um, I lived in a house that had well water. And so uh, we had water that was pumped into our house um, from an aquifer or groundwater. So that's another source of fresh water because that was, you know. Yeah, and that accounts for 1.69% of all of the Earth's water. Whoa. And looking around, I am reminded that there's a lot of water in the glaciers, ice, and snow all across the world. It's kind of like a time capsule for water almost. Oh. And yeah. I believe that accounts for 1.76% of all of the Earth's water. Yeah. 
And I'm thinking about that song about precipitation, and clouds hold some water too. Oh yeah. Uh, they hold zero point zero zero one percent of all the fresh water on Earth. That's a super super tiny number. Hmm. I'm also reminded of Ranger Clay and the cute little otters. Oh, all around fun. So rivers hold zero point zero 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 two percent. Of all of Earth's water. Nice. And there's some ones that you might not think of right away, but that is uh, soil. Soil holds 0.1% of water. And then the plants and animals also hold some water, and they hold 0.01% as well. Wow. Tiny numbers. Yeah, that adds up to, like, less than 4%, I think. Yeah. Well... The bad news is that all the rest is salty ocean water. Oceans hold 96.5% of all of Earth's water. And since a percent means out of 100, now it all adds up to 100. Wait, 96% of all water on Earth is ocean salty water? We can't even drink that. No, so really there's not that much accessible fresh water for us to drink at all. And this is extremely important because will Earth ever get more water? No, no, this is all the water that we have. And water moves and transforms and it cycles, if you remember, but we won't ever get more water. Did you know that the water that we see now has been in the water cycle since like the dinosaurs roamed the dinosaurs wait Lushana, does that mean that we're drinking dinosaur pee oh ranger olivia you're so silly no we do not drink dinosaur pee we first of all filter all of our water and they were a long long time ago so you know if this is all the water we get on earth what are we what should we do how What should we do with it? Well, we should probably take care of it and save water because we can't afford to waste it and we've got to keep it clean and we have to value what we have. And the good news is there are ways that you and I can actually help take care of our water. And I'd like to show you a silly example of some rangers Mm -hmm. that are going to demonstrate how to save or conserve water. (laughs) 
Okay, so that was a little silly. Rangers don't <laughs> actually sleep in the visitor's center. But the point is, the ranger who let her faucet run while she was brushing her teeth wasted three gallons of water. That means every day that ranger would waste six gallons of water. Wait, why six? Because you brush your teeth twice a day. Oh, right, of course. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. So let's go ahead and think about a family of four. And let's think about how many gallons of water that family of four could save every day if they turned their water off while brushing their teeth. Hmm. Mm, that sounds like a multiplication problem. Yeah, I think it is. Hmm. So, hmm. Let's think about this. So we have a family of four saving six gallons of water per day. Four times six. That would be 24 gallons of water per day. Wow. And then for a whole week, if we multiply 24 by seven, we get 168 gallons per week. And a whole year? Hmm. 168 times 52? That's 8,736 gallons of water per year. That's like swimming pools worth of water. Wow. And what if, you know, our family did this and then you told another family to do this and on and on. Well, some of you might already do this, turn the water off while you brush your teeth. But what are some other ways that you could save water? Hmm. Ranger Olivia, do you have any other ideas of how we could save water? Hmm, I think the next easiest one would probably be to take shorter showers. Mm. That's a really easy one. Do you have any other ideas, Ranger Lushana? Yeah, so uh, in my hometown, we like to garden. And so one of the ways that you could save water is actually by planting, uh, using plants that don't take that much water and are native to wherever you live. Oh, that's a really cool idea. So we've been talking a lot about how Grand Teton has a reliable water source, which is our snowpack. But there are other places that are naturally a lot drier, like Death Valley National Park in California, which is the hottest and driest desert in the United States. And with climate change, these dry places are getting even drier and they aren't getting the snow or water that they need. And some recent examples of this are the big wildfires that we had this past year in California and Colorado and all over Australia. And climate change is also making the wet places in our world even wetter, which can be a big problem. And some examples you can think about are some major flooding along the northern coast of California as well as in Kentucky. So think about your hometown and what you may have been experiencing there. Yeah, uh, find out what's happening in your region. If your area is getting drier, then it is going to be extremely important to save water. And if your hometown is getting wetter, it is still going to be important for you to save water so that water can move on or cycle to some drier areas. It will also be important to keep your water clean. I'm sure you can think of some places in the United States or around the world where people don't have access to clean drinking water. Hmm. So encourage your friends and neighbors to save water and keep their water clean uh, and then tell them to teach someone else how to save water and so on and so on. Pass it on so that we have enough H2O for everyone. Oh my goodness, that sounds like a big job ahead. So let's recap what we've talked about. The world only has one supply of water, and this water can exist in three different ways. I wonder if our viewers remember the hand motions. Mm. We'll help you out here. We have solid, liquid, and gas. And water moves through these three states as it travels through the water cycle. If you remember from that fun song, it goes evaporation, condensation, and precipitation. Yes, and the water that we have in Grand Teton National Park might end up at, as your drinking water, or your water might end up in Grand Teton National Park in one of our rivers or lakes or glaciers. So we have to take care of the water in order to protect the environment and the wildlife. And protecting the wildlife is part of protecting the park. And 
It is a pretty big job for park rangers to have to protect Grand Teton National Park, and sometimes our work is not enough. So we think it's up to the owners of national parks to help protect them. Hmm, I want to think about who owns national parks. Hmm, let's see. I want you to give yourself a thumbs up at home and then point that thumb right at yourself because yes, you own national parks. And then I want you to take that thumb and point it to someone that might be nearby and they own national parks and everyone that you're pointing to owns national parks. National parks belong to your teachers, your friends, your family, and of course you. And so <coughs> they also belong to the future generation. So they belong to future kids and future grandkids and future great grandkids as well, which means that we have to protect them. So we challenge you, your family, and your classrooms to talk more about how to protect national park sites that might be near you. And there are over 400 national park sites around the United States. And just to name a couple really special places, there's Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Yosemite National Park, Zion National Park, and Big Bend National Park. So we challenge you to take more virtual field trips, learn, explore, become a junior ranger, and find your park. In the words of the Lorax, unless, unless someone, someone like you cares a whole awful, awful lot, lot nothing, nothing is going, going to get, get better, better. It's, it's not. not. And we hope you care a whole awful lot about Grand Teton National Park and other national parks near you. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast of Snow Desk. And we actually have a few minutes for questions from our comment section. So just a reminder, if you have questions, go ahead and go to our Facebook page and comment below the Snow Desk post. And we will answer your questions. Hmm. So we have a question from Hudson and Sydney. Uh, what is our favorite part of the park? And also, how cold does it get here? Um, well, my favorite part of the park, mm, I think I really like the rivers here. I love to go fishing. We have a, a really awesome native trout species, and they're super fun to catch. And they're um, really endemic to this environment. So that means that they only really live in this ecosystem. And I love that. That's awesome. That's a tough one. I have a lot of favorite places in the park, but I really like to spend some time way up high in our mountains. Nice. And then how cold does it get here? Um, well, it can really vary. Like today, it's probably in the 20s, but our coldest day ever on record uh, was negative 63 degrees. Um, and so that gets pretty cold. Yeah. It gets pretty cold, but that's uh, a pretty big extreme, I would say. Yeah, and just for reference, the inside of your freezer at home is about zero degrees. So that means that your freezer is 63 degrees warmer than our coldest day here. Burr. <laughs> All right, so we have a question from Emma in Oklahoma. She's wondering how tall snow desk is and how much snow we have right now accumulated. Mm -hmm. So I would say snow desk is a, s I would say snow desk is a solid four, four and a half feet at this point. Its height has varied a little bit as snow has fallen and melted. And we have about 130 inches of snow in the valley floor so far this winter. Yes, that's a lot of snow. Yeah. We got even more snow last January, though. Oh, yeah. Just one month. Yes. I wonder how much, like, even just sitting here right now at Snow Desk, like, I can see that we probably got about maybe a quarter to a half an inch just uh, sitting out here right now. Yeah, my, my piano is completely <laughs> buried. <laughs> Hmm. What is our favorite animal that lives in the park? It's from Elizabeth in Wyoming. Great. So, hmm, my favorite animal that lives in the park. 
Oh, Olivia, do you have one? I it's ho- it's so hard to choose. I know it's so hard. I think mine is probably the pika. Ooh, and yes. the pika is a really tiny little thing. It's about the size of a hamster, and it's small and gray, and it's actually a member of the rabbit family. And they're very small and cute, and they live way, way high up in the mountains. And they actually don't hibernate or migrate. They are awake all winter long. Wow. And they build these really cool, ginormous haystacks that are about the size of a snow desk made out of grasses and flowers so they can munch all winter long on their favorite food oh wow that is that's wow they're so smart they love to plan ahead cool so we have a question from delaney and ainsley in indiana who are asking what kind of uh animal skins we have on our desk and um why, why they're here? Well, let's see if we can unearth them <laughs> or unbury them. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Very snowy. So the animal that I have here is the Canada lynx. So this is uh, one of our winter warriors in Grand Teton. This animal lives in the mountain. It's about a medium-sized uh, cat, and it... Uh, has these huge paws in the winter that help them get around on all the snow. And we have it here just so that um, people would ask about them. And I'm glad that they did. What, what do you have, Olivia? Let's see. I have a beautiful wolverine here, also a winter warrior. And during the winter, wolverines use their sense of smell to survive. And I believe this is the largest member of the weasel family. And um, they are able to smell seven feet underneath the snow and they feast on frozen dead animals throughout the whole winter and they are very cool they have very sharp claws and it would be a real treat to get to see one one day i've never yes, seen one i've never seen one i don't really know that i've ever heard, like none of my friends here have ever seen one either they're no, very they're elusive actually, they're pretty rare to see yeah. in the entire uh, yellowstone ecosystem thanks for your question delaney and ainsley yes Oh, that's a fun question. We have some students asking how thick the ice is on our lakes and if we ever go ice skating on them. And that's from Kenzie, Keaton, Kimber, and Kelby. That is an awesome question, you guys. Yes. So just like the height of the snow at Snow Desk, like I was saying, sometimes Snow Desk gets taller when it's snowing quite a bit and shorter when it melts. The ice is kind of the same way on the lake, but if I had to take a guess, I would say it's probably about maybe half a foot to a foot thick right now. Yeah. Maybe on Jackson Lake. It also depends on the size of the lake, because I think yeah. that maybe smaller lakes would have uh, less deep ice. And people do sometimes go ice skating on them, but it has to be just the right conditions, because you have to make sure there isn't any snow on the ice. Right. So or else- y- you have to make sure that there's enough ice and lots of wind to blow the snow away yes or else you'd be doing a lot of shoveling and i do not want to shovel what a hundred and something inches of snow off the ice no me either (laughs) oh sweet and there's a beautiful picture of jackson lake jenny lake just kidding (laughs) but yes okay james from illinois asks How much water flows through the Snake River? Hmm, that's an excellent question. Um, So the Snake River is a super important river in this area. Uh, I don't off the top of my head know like how many, like what the volume of water that flows through that river is. I know that it um, starts in this area and it flows all the way over to the Columbia River system through Idaho and it meets up with the Columbia. And this is uh, the Jackson Lake Dam. So a lot of water from Jackson Lake, which we just mentioned, flows into the Snake River. And so um, at any given moment, maybe 
depending on the dam, there will be more or less water in the Snake River. But typically, snow melt in the spring makes the river really high in the spring, and then as we get nearer to fall, it, the uh, water volume kind of peters, peters lower. So Delaney is asking, how many people work in Grand Teton? And that is a really thoughtful question, Delaney. And that also changes quite a bit with the seasons because some rangers work here all year round and some rangers just work here in the summer. So during the summer, we have about 700 rangers working in Grand Teton National Park. Yeah. And volunteers as well, not just seasonals. Yeah, and they do all sorts of jobs. Um, they will be rangers like us who are interpretive rangers who help um, people learn about the park. We also have people who work on the trails in the park. And uh, we also have people, uh, rangers, who study the animals and the geology in the park. Yeah, and Lushana and I actually have different jobs during the summer. Lushana, do you want to share what your summer job is in the park? Yeah, my summer job is I'm a fish biologist, so I help study those uh, really awesome trout that I was talking about earlier. And what about you, Olivia? Yeah, so during the summer I work on the fire effects crew, which means I look at the effects of wild and prescribed fires on the landscape. All cool. right, so it sounds like we are all out of time for questions. Remember to tag your pictures, hashtag SnowDesk2021. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day. I will see you all later. Oh, oh <laughs> yes, we have so much snow. <laughs>